Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. My name is Anna Rafel. I am your host of At This Stage, presented by Camp Broadway. Here with our friends at Streamable Learning, I am live to you from my apartment in New York City, connecting you with Broadway professionals on and off the stage, connecting them to you, our friends, our families, our students, and our teachers. And we're so excited to have you today. Feel free to start sending me those questions on your Q&A feature, and I promise I will get to as many of them as I can. I am so excited to introduce you to our guest today. She is Ruthie Fearberg. Hi, Ruthie. Uh-oh, she muted herself. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Ruthie. I'm gonna do a quick bio on Ruthie. Ruthie is a, the current senior features editor at Playbill. She creates innovative and engaging content, content through in-depth written multimedia and video pieces focused on the arts. We're gonna get to see some of those today. She also hosts, I'm so jealous, the Playbill Live from the Red Carpet specials on Broadway opening nights. She is a graduate of Barnard College and written for such national publications as Good Housekeeping, Parents, American Baby, Parents Latina, and Backstage Magazine, and many, many other things. You sure keep yourself busy there, Ruthie. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I am so thrilled to talk to you guys. This is really a dream come true for me to talk. Where to where are you? Demo. Yes, yes. Where are you? How you feeling today? Um, I'm in my apartment in Harlem. Yeah, New York. Um, I feel good. I feel good. I feel like strange saying that I feel good, but um, as you mentioned, I keep myself really busy. Um, yeah. And the quarantine has not changed that. I just do it all in one place instead. So, you know, my work for Playbill by day and doing things like this on my lunch hour and working on personal projects like a podcast at night and exercising and I'm living for all of these like stream oh workout classes. I'm yeah. getting back into my dance classes, which I haven't done in like a decade. So Pilates and yoga and awesome. All of That's it. so fun. Yeah. So amazing. Okay. Before we get into all the Playbill work, which I have so many questions, let's go back to the beginning. How were you introduced to theater? What are your earliest memories of theater and maybe a memorable, memorable moment you remember? Yeah. Um, I mean, I feel like I, like theater is just passed down in the DNA. My, my mother, um, was, uh, semi-professional singer and did like community theater and all that and the joke is that me and my brother and my sister um my mother was pregnant with each of us during a different community theater production so like I was the fiddler on the roof baby like literally in utero my mother my mother was playing Seidel and then like fast forward 12 years to when I was in the eighth grade and I played Seidel so like it was just gonna happen you know um, yeah one of my earliest memories I don't know that this is like a true memory but I've seen the videos of me like at two years old in a diaper, you know, scream singing, God, I hope I get it from a chorus <laughs> line. Like it was mm -hmm. always there, but I do fully remember, like I said, my mom sang and she um, was part of like a cabaret act that did things like corporate luncheons you know, back when that was a thing or yeah. like, you know, performed at the Special Olympics in Connecticut. And um, I remember going to rehearsals with her and I remember her rehearsing at home. So mm. I was very well versed in like the scores of everything from Guys and Dolls and Les Mis to like mm -hmm. Mac and Mabel when I was four years old, like Funny Girl, all of that. Um, so it's, it's a long time been there. And then like, you know, I grew up doing theater and I, I started taking ballet when I was two and you know. involved in all of that yeah, yeah exactly. and then when did you sort of make the switch maybe make the switch to writing or sort of you realize that there was another way to maybe still be involved in theater so that was not until college um okay. and not even until my sophomore year of college I had no I had no intention of being a journalist. I did not work on the high school newspaper, not the yearbook, not any of it. 
um, I did perform throughout high school. So like the theater love was always consistent, but mm -hmm. the journalism piece of it came to be in college when I was auditioning for things. And I, Columbia, Barnard is one of the four undergraduate colleges of Columbia University. And it was very competitive. I don't know if it was just like, you know, it's not a conservatory. It's not like a big theater program, but the theater right. kids that were there were very good. And maybe part of it was like, you know, we're in New York City, but I couldn't get cast in anything. And I was sad about it. <laughs> and my right. father, uh, who's a very wise man, said to me, you know, well, why don't you write for the school paper? You're in New York. I bet you'd get free tickets. So it was my quest to like see more theater if I couldn't be doing it. So I signed up for the school paper. And then, um, I mean, I was too terrified to write for them for at least a full semester. Wow. Um, and then I bumped into the theater editor of the paper whose listserv I was on. And she was like, I know you. And I was like, I don't know you. She's like, no, 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 I know you. And she figured out that she knew my name from her listserv and okay. was like, you need to write for me. I'll help you. It'll be fine. I wrote my first feature and she was like, you're a natural. And now I'm making you write everything. And the <laughs> joke is that I wrote features. I started writing, you know, interviews and like this, a profile on this new um, theater group on campus or what have you. And I didn't get my first free tickets until one year later. <laughs> <laughs> it took a while to get this but they were good free tickets. Oh, okay. Well, that was um, worth I went to see Cheetah Rivera at Feinstein's on the Upper East Side. Ooh, that is a good free ticket to get. Free ticket. So yeah. yeah, and then I became the theater editor at the paper. Like I took over her editorship when she graduated and I had an internship at Backstage Magazine, which is how I ended up writing for them professionally after I graduated. And oh, very cool. All and did you, did you cover at school? Did you cover, I mean, Obviously, you went to see Cheetah, but did you do stuff just within the school or outside of no. the school? Theater, the arts and entertainment section at Columbia. So it was the Columbia Daily Spectator is our newspaper. And we also, so we had a daily arts section. Then we had an expanded weekend arts section. Okay. And then we had um, a weekly magazine that was all arts and entertainment. Oh, focused. wow. Now I think they've divided it into two different editorships, which makes okay. a lot more sense. But <laughs> at the time- You did it all. I did it all. Um, all of the arts editors did it all. So TV was the same, you know, everybody was okay. the same. Um, but that was like the best training I could have ever asked for. Um, between like the technical stuff of like Adobe InCopy and also just like what it is to be an editor, what it is to brainstorm pitches, what it is to interview and write a story. Um, and we covered all undergraduate theater. We covered mm -hmm. the graduate schools, had some theater programs. I specifically remember like the med school had this very intense drama extracurricular group oh. uh, that I found fascinating. And then it was like, we covered all of the extracurricular theater on campus as well as the, the departmental stuff and then it was like yeah we covered Broadway like I remember writing a review of the, like the 2009 revival of West Side Story um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because we are ticket buyers you know we're in New Absolutely. York so um, things like that I did a, an interview with Julia Stiles when she was in Oleana on Broadway mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm because she's a Columbia alum. So she was really into that. We're like, oh, nice. you know, yeah, to the school. And yeah, so we covered it all. I'm used to, I'm used to doing the cover it all. <laughs> yes. Well, do you find that, um, I'm going to switch gears, but a little bit, but you, you mentioned so many different, um, types of articles and things that you wrote. I mean, do you find that you're drawn to a specific, to covering more actors or designers or do you like to feature sort of everybody? I like it all. I like it all. I like anyone who, and, and not just I like it all, but I also feel a responsibility to cover it all. Um, I think that there are, I differ in the fact and Playbill differs in the fact that like, 
we cover the stars and, but we certainly cover performers. And it's important to me, I, I find that process so individual and so fascinating. I never want to get to a day where I don't talk to actors, <laughs> but I also don't want to ever live a day where I don't talk to a choreographer or a costume designer or a director or an audio engineer or um, a press, you know, a press rep about what they do. Cause obviously I talk to press reps all day. Um, there are, for those of you who don't know, like they're the liaisons between all of the talent and the journalists. So when I want to talk to Patty Lapone, I reach out to the press representative for company on Broadway and they make that happen. Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah I find it all fascinating artistry is artistry I mean I think it's I think it goes without saying it's hard when you're in high school to see all the different jobs that it takes to put on a musical how how 100% I how think musical. that is a particular passion of mine because um in the midst of all of this theater writing in college I I was by no means like it wasn't like I started writing for the Columbia Daily Spectre, Spectator and was like ah now I know what I'm doing with my life forget yeah. everything else no I was pre-med I was still pre-med um I ended up veering away from that yes. obviously <laughs> but it wasn't like aha journalism is the new frontier for me I I was still exploring and so in between my junior and senior years which was the summer of 2009 I worked for a producing partnership um, between Kevin McCollum and Jeffrey Seller called The Producing Office. They are now separate, um, amicably, totally good, just totally different good. interests. <laughs> um, but they're the team behind Rent and Avenue Q and In the Heights. Um, and Kevin separately did The Drowsy Chaperone and Jeffrey um, is the lead producer on Hamilton, though Kevin also invested in that. So they invest in each other's projects and that was my first exposure to the business of Broadway and like, oh, where does the, like the money has to come from somewhere. Absolutely. Then the money has to be managed by someone. That's the general managers who like comes up with a budget and is like, you get this much for costumes and this much <laughs> for an opening night party and this much for salaries and this much for the lawyer who makes all of our contracts and like, just all of that stuff that you never think about. And then like, you know, advertising yeah. budgets and all of that. And because of the different parts of the processes they were on, you know, like um, Avenue Q was closing that summer and moving to off Broadway. So that was one thing to look at. Whereas like In the Heights was launching its first national tour. So I was tracking all of the investments. That. Whereas Ragtime was ramping up for a fall opening. So I was privy to uh, conversations about the development of that artwork. So that was where I got a really big like bird's eye view of like, here are a lot of different things I had no idea went into making theater. And at Playbill, we do a theater jobs column, I would call it, um, where I talk to all of these different people, whether you're like a cast album producer or a music director or, you know, all the people that I don't talk to every single production. Like mm -hmm. when a Broadway production comes around, I often talk to the costume designer and the scenic designer and the director, but I'm not always talking to the music director. And I'm certainly not talking to the keyboard programmer or whatever it is. And all of these things make all of the theater, play or musical, Broadway or community theater, regional house that everybody sees wherever they are. And I think it's so important to know that like, maybe you love being in the spotlight right now, but you don't want it to be your life. Maybe you don't like being in the spotlight at all. There are so many more things to do besides being on the stage or even being in the wings of like, being a stage manager or a crew member. There are so many things outside the physical theatrical house. Yes, no, absolutely. Thank you for re, re saying that. That's so important to hear. 
Um, let's look at, we're going to look at a couple of your articles because you have such a unique way of delving into um, the, co like you said, the costume designer, the set designer, and, and taking a look at, at things that are, that as an audience member, you, you don't get, you're not privy to see. Yeah. So which, which one are you going to start us off with? Well, let me just say that it's like constantly my MO, excuse me, to, um, to really convey that every part of a production is about the overall storytelling. That like the shirt that they picked is not a coincidence. Like it's right. blue for a reason. It has a collar for a reason. The set is bricks of a certain color for a reason. Like everything tells story and comes with intention. So that's what I'm trying to accomplish in my pieces is to show like all of that process. So that being said, let's look at this. Okay, so this is, sorry, let me scroll. Ooh, I know that one. one. Okay, so I did an interview with Michael Crass, who is the costume designer of Hades Town. Hades Town fans out there. Um, and I was obsessed with these costumes, especially because they pretty much don't change. Like Persephone, she changes um, from green to black, but like most of it's just like taking off layers and so the characters from this show are so tied to their wardrobes in a very, I mean, like I said, every show, but like in this very specific way, because that's the image they're going to be. So as the headline says, it's, you know, how he used fashion to make Hades Towns players into singular characters, especially because with these characters coming from Greek mythology, there are a lot of different, uh, conceptions of what they could be so we did a little interview and that's like this part here is his general philosophy the conversations he had with um director rachel chavkin and the book writer and composer lyricist anais mitchell to say that like this is not a specific time and place um right. we want this to be able to live just in general and so, and also this idea of like Americana was very, so then you start looking at the piece in a different way. And this was, so for Eurydice, played by Eva Noblezada, this is like one of the early sketches that he made. Well, I guess not so early, because this was like once the idea was, you know, a certain, right, like far, farther along in the process, but certainly not finished. Right. Um, and so you get cool facts like Rachel Chavkin says that she relates to Eurydice the most. And so that became an inspiration to Michael's design that he looked at photos of Rachel when she was young. And but he also looked at um, photos of a young Madonna, which if you, you can look up this photo. Um, yeah. Actually, let me open it here because that's why I'm a big fan of digital because you can link out and like <laughs> here is the photo oh, wow. of Madonna in this yeah. coat and this scarf that like that he thought of because she's like textured and she's influential but she has this style and humor so yeah. you get something like that then you move to Hades who is like I mean total opposite of like <laughs> this bohemian you know goddess is he's like the rough gangster like businessman so that's where you get like the pinstripes um like he says this depression era politician and a lot of mm -hmm. it was drawn from the great depression because of the conflict they're creating on stage of like, like the underworld being this industrial oppressed place right. that right. then that's where he's you know gathering inspiration but that he wanted but that so you can see here he's wearing snakeskin cowboy boots and that he wanted the american swagger of cowboy boots but then the right. snake references because when you think about like 80s you know the bible and you think about greek mythology like snakes have that sinister 
um, ethos to them. And then we just continue right. on and you guys can, you know, you guys can go and look up um, playbill.com, Hades Town Costumes. It'll be the first link that comes up. And you can find out, you know, why is Hermes this like shark skin silver suit, which is also very different from the off-Broadway version of Hermes. Um, you can find out like, you know, why the the scarf and the apron for Orpheus, why is Persephone green? Um, the entirely fresh design of the leather and everything like that for the workers chorus why the fates are how they are, which we didn't have a sketch, but we did have research that he compiled because wow. all of these designers are very heavily researched, which actually brings me to this piece I recently did with William Ivy Long, um, who, let me see if it'll unfreeze, um, who was designing the costumes for Diana, which is currently on hiatus. Um, Let's see if that'll reload. Um, but he is a, is it 17 times? I definitely I mean, that's, yeah, something like that. I definitely, I always put it in here because it's like, what? 17 times Tony nominated? That's insane. Um, and he designed 38 costumes for wow. just the character of Diana. And to give you a sense of the scale, a typical leading lady usually has between five and 12. Wow. So quite literally triple the high end. Um, and what fascinates me about him, and we've done pieces with him on his Beetlejuice costumes, on his Tootsie costumes, on... Um, gosh, I've done so many, on his Grease Live costumes. Mm -hmm. um, his research is so intense and all of, and, and that's true of all designers that they really go into um, whether it's catalogs from a time period. So like he was looking at catalogs, Sears catalogs from the 60s to see how people wore their jeans or yearbooks from that time period because Greece was set in a high school. And so similarly, like he didn't really have to gather research for Diana. Right. It's a lot is, of that. He is a princess die obsessive, <laughs> um, but he nevertheless did have a lot of research up on the walls here. Wait, maybe if I close out some of these tabs, it'll move a little faster bandwidth in the time of COVID-19 is not our friend. Oh, there it is. Wow. Um, I want to see if I can get back to some of this research because he has literally these pin boards that go from floor to ceiling that he covers in, you know, newspaper photos and magazine photos and like I said, catalogs, and sometimes it's actually even artwork. Um, you know, he's heavily inspired, not for this show, but okay. for others by the artist Basquin. And it, it's all in like keeping in the ethos of what you're trying to do. So here you can see like, this is a close up of one of those pin boards where he's just like looking at the silhouettes and looking at the colors um, mm -hmm. that then inspire something like this sketch, which is, as you can read in the caption, the first date that Diana goes on with Charles and she's in this emerald gown, but it also needs to be able to transition for this dance number. So there's also what's different about fashion design versus costume design is that there's this functionality of like needing to do quick changes or on stage changes or, you know, being able to high kick or, yeah. you know, it all changes. Um, and again, like someone, you know, Madonna's the inspiration for everyone. So I mean, um, inspired by Madonna here. And then he, he does two types of sketches. He does a paper doll sketch um, to like figure out proportions and things like that. And then he does this ink sketch that he sends along to his manufacturers so that they can understand like the vibrancy and the movement mm -hmm. of pieces mm -hmm. rather than being so stiff. Um, so this is like an extra step that he does for himself just to, I guess, convey a feeling. Sure. Rather than gotcha. yeah, then, absolutely. thanks to oh, advertising, 
Um, um, thanks to our staff photographer, Mark J. Franklin, he went and, and photographed um, the actual costume pieces on dress forms at the Midtown Warehouse, like where they're made and stored. So you can see how that green dress like actually gets sewn and comes to life. That's and amazing. You can see the close up on these like these sleeves, details. details and like, but again, it's not just because like a puffy sleeve looks cute. It's because in the beginning, they want to show her, like she was 19 when she first, you know, entered this right. public life and, you know, being courted by the prince. And there is this naivete and an, in, an inferred simplicity, though she was not simple, people perceived her that way. So that he goes with these, you know, these more childish, young, ruffles and bows and then you get into a more sophisticated when she starts sure. feeling her power in the public eye you know the ruffles go away but you still have this feminine bow and mm -hmm. again you can flip through this article and um you know see what you want to see um and another one of my favorite things that we do is um this was the first one I ever did. I am obsessed with Steven Levinson as a playwright, as a television writer, as a person. I think he's brilliant. I have never seen a work of his I haven't loved. Um, and he is the Tony winning book writer of Jared Hansen. And so I wanted to know, cause I think, you know, Benj, and, Benj Pasek and Justin Paul's score is unbelievable. Not to take away from that at all, but I think that the brilliant strength of Dear Evan Hansen and that the reason why it resonates with so many people is because it has a, a really strong book supporting Absolutely. that music. Oh, for and sure. The book of a musical is so hard because so much of the book is actually not written. Like, yes, right. that's physically the product <laughs> you hand over, but so much of what the book is, is like, you are the person that sets the rules for the character that then informs the people who write the songs. Like you are the person who builds the structure of the story and like, what is the emotional apex and where do we land? That's going right. to every other decision on that stage. And of course, like all of this is done in collaboration with director Michael Greif and the whole team. But so I wanted to get inside Steven's head as best I could. <laughs> so again, we did a whole interview talking about his process and how he does that. And then I said, okay, I need to see it. So we had him annotate the opening scene, that opening very famous monologue of like, dear, you know, yeah, Evan 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 Evan. on the bed, <laughs> writing his himself yeah. a note. And you can see, first of all, the stage directions, which are so cool. But then um, you can see that like the stage direction of like the silence Benj and Justin and I always discuss this section as our overture because you realize you're like, oh yeah, Evan there isn't. Doesn't have an overture. Right. Um, and to find out that like originally the monologue was shorter and he yeah. was nervous to take up so much time and not get to that first song quickly as is common in a musical. But then they realized that the monologue kind of was the opening number. And you right. can hear like why he writes um, with the rhythm that he does and um, you know, why punctuation is important. And <laughs> you know, amazing. this idea of like when his mom Heidi enters the room, um, that it- Pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so here it's like Evan shuts his laptop and he says, Evan does this every time his mother enters the room, but she only reali realizes it in act two, which is yeah. like, whoa, then you're like <laughs> connecting things in the first scene to the end. And again, going on with this mission of like, just communicating to readers and to my audience, how much effort and thought and process goes into the storytelling and the looping and the connections and like, how much of a reverse engineered puzzle Dear oh, absolutely. is in particular, like slight spoiler alert, I won't actually give it away, but like, you know, the cast is very famous. Yeah. And it becomes clear in act two of the show, like the real reason he broke his arm 
And that was something that Stephen uncovered in his writing process. He oh, didn't like, write wow. it towards that. It was like, he had a broken arm and Stephen was like, I know he has it for a reason. Like there's something more to this. And it like reverse engineered itself to have wow. more meaning because he was planting seeds for this thing that then he like almost discovered his own buried treasure in his brain. And that stuff just fascinates me. And I think yeah. it should fascinate everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, I agree. So there's that stuff. And then, oh, can I bring up one more? You can, yeah. Um, because we also do a lot of integration with video. That's what I mean with like 360 content is that like in digital, you have the capability to have a photo gallery like that with big captions that like in print, you just don't have the space. Right. Um, so let me do choreographers. Uh, Choreographers cut Sergio. Uh, so I, I've invented a video series where you can like learn a combination from um, choreographers who are working on Broadway and, you know, get to see, like get to learn the moves yourself. And sometimes I encourage them to share like the intention behind that movement but sometimes it gets a little like you know we get mired down in the steps of it so sure. what i did um this past tony season was i asked Ooh. a couple of choreographers to come in and they watch a video of themselves or they watch a video of their choreography and kind of narrate it and oh. you can watch unlike a director's cut where you're just hearing them the choreographer's cut is kind of like a split screen okay um, so let me see if I can get it to play. And if not, you guys will just have to do your homework yeah. on streamable Do work. a little homework and look at, yeah. Um, That's cool. It really explains like why there's a pop of the head here and why they're kicking here and why, like why this arm is with a flexed hand instead of a hand this way. Because again, it's all intention and storytelling. Right, it's um, not just there because it's pretty. Exactly. Like, it's also pretty, but it really is there to tell. That's, to me, that's the difference between choreography and dance. Like, dance is choreography, but not, uh, or choreography is dance, but not all dance is necessarily choreography. Um, sure. And, and that's why these people are at the level they are. Uh, it looks like it's being super duper slow. That's but okay. We'll do our we'll do our homework uh, and and you guys find can it do out your there. homework and watch yeah. Sergio's choreographer's cut. I'm gonna. I don't know if I can pause it now. I don't want it to like stop in the middle of our. That's okay. If you bring bring back to us. Hi, Sergio Trujillo, choreographer oh, oh, of There it goes. Here I'm That's so okay. Break Hold down on. one of my favorite numbers. I'll Pop bring down. back the screen share. Okay, we'll watch like two seconds. This is uh, one of my favorite numbers in this show um, because of the setup of it, it has so much anticipation. David Ruffin and Eddie have left the group. They formed their own group, but then they decide they all have an encounter and where they decide that perhaps it's a, it's a good idea for them to reunite. So this is the first time they're together in a long time. Uh, and we have three new members. It is, you know, to me, this is like, this is Sergio at his best. I just let myself go when I was choreographing this number. I also looked at it through the lens of today. Some of, there's some, a little bit of a hints of hip hop and uh, some pop and lock. I wanted the number to have an evolution uh, from the moment that we start the, our show, from the way you do the things you do choreographically to this moment. And this is as hip and as close to, to the period, uh, uh, late period in, in, the, in, the, in, in the period of choreography. Um, so you get a little bit of a flavor there of like, he's giving you the storytelling setup of the number and he's gonna go into like individual movements. But what my role in like the production of that video is I was standing off camera and saying mm -hmm. to him, 
So what, like, tell me what is the moment we're entering right now? Why is it important to the story? Like I'm prompting all of that. And then I would see something in the choreography like the da 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 And I was like, why yeah. is it doing that? Why is it, you know, so I'm asking the why to prompt right. him to then answer that, which then we cut all together in a video that you never see me in. Right. I just get all of his responses. Exactly. Amazing. Okay, I, I gotta ask you some of these questions. Do it so, up. So clearly you are passionate about theater and everything that makes it tick. How are you covering theater now when there are no shows running? What, what have you been forced to find other avenues? I mean, there are, so the Playbill team in general has been doing all of the coverages of like, of cancellations and arts organizations affected by this, um, postponements, online streaming, all of that. Um, in features, features has changed a great deal. So my first like week was all like, okay, what, how can people consume theater at home? So it's everything from like the 47 classic movie musicals you can stream to the 26 modern musicals you can stream to the mm -hmm. on stage like captured performances or the theater related books to read or the audiobooks narrated by Broadway performers. And it was a lot of like how to stay connected to theater um, while there isn't theater on any stage, let alone Broadway. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Now I am, um, I have a backlog of features that, you know, things are often timely and, and mm -hmm. on a calendar because this Broadway show is opening or more often this off Broadway show is happening and it, an off Broadway show is such a short run right. that you really have to get features out fast. So there are things about larger initiatives in theater that I am now getting to finally write. I've been writing mm -hmm. a piece um, all morning about Maestra Music, which is a nonprofit organization um, to help female identifying non-binary gender non-conforming musicians like get mm -hmm. hired. And I think that's important. I'm writing we're a story talking about- to, We're talking to Georgia Sit tomorrow. Yeah, she said, she said, yep. yeah, Georgia yep. found it. So it was funny because I was like living in Georgia land. Um, so I'm writing that and I'm writing, um, you know, all of these Broadway like sewers and costume designers and, and yeah. departments and theaters all over the country have started sewing gowns and masks and things. So I'm uh, covering the relief efforts. There's a class at NYU that is um, before all of this happened was specializing in uh, technology, the merger of technology and drama and how you can use like VR spaces to hmm. rehearse and perform, which now is like so relevant. So timely. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's a mix of like, what are these lists we can do to keep people engaged? What are the things that people really need to know about in terms of causes? Um, mm -hmm. And then in general, I will get back to the, you know, of course. Uh, profile on Adrienne Warren, because whether or not she's on stage doing Tina, she's done that role for over a year. And that is still yeah. fascinating to talk to her. Yes. So you'll get some of the regular theater content coming back. I think, you know, we have to be, you're always having to be sensitive about what your readers want. And right and balancing that with what you think and hope they need. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's always a balance at any time. And then particularly in a crisis, I, you know, on day one, you're not gonna talk to Adrian about her artistry, but like, right. this is clearly gonna last a little while. So we'll keep, we'll keep making theater content. It's Absolutely. Worry. That leads me into, you know, what advice do you have for our young aspiring writers? What, what can they do, especially during this time, but just in general, uh, just some advice for them? So I think a few things. Um, number one, read, read, read. Um, find the writers that you like, whether they're writing about theater or something else, and like start paying attention to the structure of how they write and what you like about them. Is it their humor? Is it, 
you know, their cleverness? Is it that you learn some, you know, you learn a new word every time because they use, like, I like to read people who use vocabulary I don't always know <laughs> because I think that that you learn word, yeah. have to learn the word and get smarter. Um, so read a lot. Um, then I would say write a lot. So before I was professionally in the editorial world, which by the way, between the time I graduated and when I actually became my first editorial job, I think was three years or three and a half, somewhere like that. I graduated in 2010 and I, I think it was 2013 that I was on the edit staff of parents. Okay. And, um, but in between there, I, I missed writing. And so I started a blog and I, didn't know who would read it. I didn't know if it mattered that anyone would read it. I just made it a point for myself to write on this topic mm -hmm. of what I, it's where my Twitter handle comes from. People are like, why are you Rufy's A train? Because my blog was called the A train because it was all about maximizing life mm -hmm. and like yeah. riding, like living your A plus life. And then specifically in New York, like often, well, often particular to New York or like this greater theme of like engage with culture. Here's how I did it this week at this museum in New York. So like broad, but also specific. Um, and I held myself to be accountable to write once a week on that blog. And it became like in the beginning, it was hard. You know, I'd say like the first three, I was like, I've been waiting to write a blog for so long. They came out and then all of a sudden like week four came, I was like, what am I going to write about? <laughs> and it forces your brain to think in a different way. And then suddenly in, you know, week 10, it was like, oh, or maybe not that fast. Maybe it was more like week 20, but you get <laughs> used to writing and right. you, like, writing is truly a muscle. Like I write features way faster now than I ever did because I do it every single hour of every single day. Absolutely. So I do that. Um, like practice interviewing. Why not? Right. Um, you know, talk to your, like when you're FaceTiming with your friends, like don't just do a little catch up, like try and figure out who they are and what's important to them. Use them as your interview subject. I think the greatest skill any interviewer can have is to be a good listener. Um, so practice listening. <laughs> and uh, yeah. yeah, I think those are some good Those are great tips. There's, that's so great. Um, I have to ask this, our last question. Um, I'm asking everybody. So Camp Broadway, who is one of the presenters, of, is the presenter of the series at this stage. Um, our motto is develop your character. So what does character mean to you? So I said this when I was on the, the develop your character podcast from Camp Broadway, which I am just so grateful to Camp Broadway for being so good to me and and letting me talk to all of you all the time. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna plagiarize my own answer because okay. it's, 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 the same. it's just, it like character to me is an integrity. It's how you carry yourself in the world. It's who you, it's who you present and, um, who you choose to be when you enter a room. And that doesn't always have to be like the authority, sophisticated, whoever, but it always has to be you. Right. And that is way harder to do than it is to say, to figure out who you are and what's important to you. But like anything, like I'm a journaler because I'm a writer. I encourage you to journal like what, especially during this time, like what is important to you? Is it a sense of adventure? Is it fun? Is it reading? If it's reading, why is it reading? Is it because <laughs> you love fantasy and escaping? Is it because you appreciate writing skill? Is it because you like solitude? Like what it like keep boiling down to like, okay, I like this thing, but what is it? And that I think will help you like anchor yourself and anchor your character to who you are. And, um, and I said this on the podcast and I'll say it again, like both of my grandfathers have kind of like drilled, I don't know mm -hmm. that they drilled into me, but like more like by osmosis that like mm -hmm. your character is you re your reputation mm -hmm. and 
you only have one, so cultivate it and treat it with great, great care. Thank you. Thank you so much for spending your time. I really, That's really appreciate really it. Sweet. If people want to find you, where can they, obviously besides playbill.com, yeah. where, else, where else can they find you and, um, and what you're up to? Please, please, please visit my website, ruthiefearberg.com, R-U-T-H-I-E-F-I-E-R-B-E-R-G.com. You can write to me through my website. I'm happy to answer questions any and all times. You can subscribe to my newsletter there where I put out like my favorite articles I've written for Playbill or um, talkbacks I've done at 92Y or podcasts that I've been on like Camp Broadway. Um, and then you can follow me on social. I'm on Twitter at Ruthie's A Train and on Instagram at Ruthie Fierceberg. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Please follow all of us. Uh, please follow all of the Camp Broadway social medias, uh, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that fun stuff. Yes, join us tomorrow, same time, 1.30, with the fantastic composer, Georgia Stitt, and we're going to talk awesome. to her. She's awesome. We're going to talk about all of her many things, including the Maestra um, project and um, just all of her stuff. Thank you, Ruthie. Thank you all. Have a great thank day. Thank you, guys.